The Intel Xeon Max CPUs have the highest memory bandwidth of any CPU you can get now because they don't just have normal DDR5. Instead, they have HBM2E memory, just like a high-end AI GPU. Now, these are not everyday CPUs. Instead, they're gonna power things like the new 2 plus exaflop Aurora supercomputer. And the coolest thing about them? You don't even need to populate the DDR5 memory channels to be able to boot into an OS. That's right, we're gonna be booting without DDR5 and we're gonna get into an operating system running completely out of high bandwidth memory. That's a lot, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is the Intel Xeon Max or better known on the STH set as the reason that we have this little pillow back here. This Intel Xeon Max is insane. It is part of the Aurora supercomputer and it is the primary processor there because it has 64 gigabytes of built-in HBM2E memory. In fact, that's more onboard HBM memory than many GPUs have. In this video, we're gonna go through everything Intel Xeon Max. We're gonna talk about some of the cool things you can do with it. We're also gonna talk about some of the weird things that happen when you use it. We're also gonna look at some benchmarks and see how fast it is. Now, before we get too far in this, I just want to point out real quick that we are going to say that Intel is sponsoring this video because, uh, well, you know, of course their support does things like get us these Intel Xeon Max CPUs so we can actually show you this, but this is only a part of the giant 2U system that was like 115 pounds that showed up to be able to do this testing. That system was so big that we only have the CPU and IO module out of that giant server and it's so heavy I'm not looking forward to bringing it back to FedEx. With that, let's go take a look at a Xeon Max delitted so you can see how this thing is even built and then we're going to get into into using this system and we're gonna show you how it works. But to understand Xeon Max and what the heck is even going on here, I figure it's worth taking a look at the delitted chip so I can show you all of the cool things that are going on. This is significantly different than Sapphire Rapids, the standard fourth gen Intel Xeon scalable processors in many ways, but on the other hand, it's, it's also the same. So we're gonna go through and I wanna show you what is the same, what's a little bit different. And since I don't have a delitted one here, what I wanna do is we're gonna use this photo that I took at Intel Vision 2022 of the actual chip. But it's not just one chip, there's a number of chiplets on this and we're going to go through what all of these are. And I'm also going to explain why they're little winglets. So in the center of this, you're going to see four large tiles. These silicon tiles have our Xeon cores and all of our normal L2 cache, L3 cache, all that kind of stuff, as well as some of the accelerators. In the Sapphire Rapids architecture, these also have things like our PCIe controllers, memory controllers, and all of that. Now with Sapphire Rapids, there are two main configurations. There's the single monolithic die configurations for the smaller core count or the lower core count parts. And then for the higher core count parts, it was easier and a higher yield way to go do this by actually breaking them up and having four different dies. Between each of these different dies, Intel's using their EMIB technology to go and have pathways between the different chips that are relatively fast. In fact, using this technology, the pathways between the different chiplets is much faster than what AMD gets. It's also a little bit harder to do this type of integration, which is why Intel does it, but AMD does not. And on a normal Sapphire Rapid Xeon, this is so good that it's almost transparent, the fact that you'd be crossing a die with your communication. There's a little bit more latency, but it's really not that bad. So while that's the same, what is different is what's sitting around that, you're going to see that there are four packages of HBM2E memory. Now, because we know this CPU is 64 gigabytes, each one of those packages has to be a 16 gigabyte HBM2E stack. Something that is really important here, because this is going to impact how this performs later on, is these HBM stacks give 16 gigabytes to each of the tiles. However, because we have that EMIB, the entire system just kind of looks like one giant CPU. On the other hand, though, what is also important is because we have that HBM2E on each of the CPU tiles, one of the challenges is that HBM2E has so much more bandwidth than just standard DDR5 that those pathways between the chips, it's actually a lot for them. And what they'll do to take this into account is they will logically think of this processor as four separate processors, each one of them with a set of cores and a 16 gig HBM2E stack. 
So although you can run it as one giant CPU with 64 gigs, the other way to think of this is also like four little CPUs with 16 gigs of super fast memory directly attached to them. What that does is it avoids all of that inter chiplet communication. But there is one other feature that will be immediately obvious to anybody that has seen a Sapphire Rapids part, and that's the little winglets. I don't know exactly what these things are called, but we're gonna call them winglets. Now on these winglets, you're gonna see a little chip and you might wonder like, what the heck is that doing there? Well, that is there so that way you can actually boost the system just using the HBM 2E memory on board and not having any DDR5 memory attached. When I first saw this, I originally thought that those winglets were not real. And then I found out that actually they were going to be part of the shipping part because they need, or one of the reasons is they need to go fit that little chip. Okay, now that we've seen the silicon, let's go look at how it performs and how we can set it up. First off, let me just show you how insanely easy it is to use HBM2E memory. And for this, we did something that I don't think Intel tested. We installed Proxmox VE8, and that is a Debian-based virtual machine container storage clustering solution that I think a lot of folks know because it's become pretty popular recently. But since it's more of a virtualization-focused distribution, it's not something that I would expect the Intel team to go validate against. And yet, we started the system without DDR5. We didn't make any BIOS changes after like pulling the memory out and the installer just booted up, the system booted up, we went into the installer and within like five to seven minutes, not only did we have Proxmox VE installed, but we also had an Ubuntu VM running on this. We were running virtualization and the VM host all off of just an HBM2E config. There was no memory in the system. So here on the dashboard, you can see that we have 112 cores, 224 threads, and we have only 128 gigabytes of memory because there's only 64 gigs of HBM2E per socket. Guys, that's absolutely insane. And we're getting more memory bandwidth from this than we got with our overclocked DDR5 6400 memory that we're gonna do a review of soon on the STH main site. But when we ran that in the Xeon W3400 series, we're getting more memory bandwidth here than we got with overclocked memory on the workstation part, but just without any DDR5 installed here. Well, I mean, crazy. Now, realistically, most of the HPC folks that use these these chips are gonna be doing a lot more tweaking than that. So one easy concept for the Xeon Max is that you can do two things with that 64 gigabytes of memory. You can either use that 64 gigs of HBM2E memory as you know, like for the entire chip, or you can partition the chip into 14 core and 16 gigabyte segments. But the idea here is really localizing that memory access. And so just taking a look at what that looks like, you can see here from the topology that we have our two sockets. And then within those two sockets, we have four NUMA nodes, each with 14 cores and that 16 gigabytes of HBM2E memory. But that's just the HBM2E only configuration that doesn't take into account what happens when we add DDR5 in because now we have another layer of memory. And so once we add DDR5, we can have a two by two matrix where we could have the you know 64 gigs for the entire CPU, the entire NUMA node, or we could split that up into these 14 core 16 gig segments. Plus we then have the DDR5 memory just to add a little bit more there. But then the other side of our two by two matrix with DDR5 is that we need to define how we do that interaction between the HBM2E and the DDR5. So then when we have is we have our HBM2E memory as a cache for all of the data that we have in our DDR5. So all the like warmest, hottest accesses, they get cached in that HBM2E memory and that speeds things up just kind of like automatically behind the scenes. The other option though, is that you could do flat mode, which means that we have a pool of HBM2E and we also have a pool of DDR5 and then the application has to pick which one it uses. For the HPC folks, they're gonna love the idea of flat mode because that gives them more options. But for everybody else, I think that the caching mode is way better because it's just literally like you install the memory in there and then all of a sudden it just works. As a fun little fact on Intel caching, it's also similar to how we had Intel Optane DC persistent memory, and that was like our big pool, kind of like DDR5 is here. And then we had faster memory, which in the DC PMM was like our DDR4, but here it's HBM2E. So it's very parallels in terms of like how Intel's designing these architectures over time. And another parallel is when we did the old Xeon Phi way back in the day that had the onboard memory that was really fast and then it had its slower memory and it, they had the same exact caching modes there. And we even ran Windows a long time ago on Xeon Phi. And just as a little wrinkle here for these screenshots, we have hyper threading on, but a lot of HPC centers will also look to turn hyper threading off. It turns out that for some HPC workloads, that's just a more efficient configuration. And so all told, we talk about having hyper threading on or off, 
having HBM2E only or adding DDR5 and then how we deal with the different memory in, you know, like flat mode or caching mode or any of that kind of stuff. We have a total of 12 different configurations that are just the primary configurations that you have to go into the BIOS and go set. And there are folks that are gonna spend all their days doing that just to go find the best performance for their application. However, that's a giant set. And so let's talk about performance because I think that's what a lot of folks are here for. Okay, on the performance side, as you would imagine, it varies a ton based on the application. And so because it requires so much optimization, I just wanna show you real quick, this is Intel's chart and like the official chart on Xeon Max performance. And also it's kind of, by the way, on a base of a Ice Lake processor, so the 8380. And I know Intel's performance team, and just frankly, they are better at tuning. So I would use these, if you have like a specific application that you need, use Intel's numbers, not ours, because they're just better at tuning for these things than we are. And just an observation here, there's a pretty wide variance in terms of how much performance speed up you get. And we saw something similar when we ran our test suite of non-HPC or mostly non-HPC applications as well. There were some applications where you don't really get a speed up. And the primary reason for that is each of the HBM2E modules takes power. And so for our total package power, like some of that's going to the HBM2E packages. And because of that, you can't really get the same clock speeds that you would get if you didn't have the HBM2E. And so you get a little bit lower clock speed. And so if there's things that literally just don't care about memory bandwidth because they're all like just just sit in cache well there you don't really get a speed up from xeon max but of course most real world workloads do see some impact of memory performance especially on servers and in most cases we did get a performance boost i just want to show one really cool one on our pricing analytics now this is based on a real world uh, very 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 sanitized data set but it's like a large oem that everybody would know billions of dollars a year in revenue and looking at what the pricing should be on individual deals based on on what region they are in the world and also you know what they have like configured on their bomb and all that kind of stuff like down to every screw or whatever rack gear you name it they have it and it would also take things into account like revenue recognition rules at the time and so this is extremely real world kind of use case for this and something that we saw was when we only ran like one instance of this we didn't necessarily get the biggest performance boost we saw a performance boost to be sure but we didn't see like a huge performance boost but what happened was we said okay well what if we go and we turn this into we turn you know the sub numa clustering on we turn this into four different partitions and run four different workloads simultaneously on the different partitions and and what we saw there was we saw a massive increase in performance with the HBM2E memory. And the reason for that is quite simple. By running four different instances, we were able to increase the amount of memory pressure that we were applying on the system. And by doing that, we were really utilizing the HBM2E memory better. And we also saw something similar happen in our virtualization testing where we are running a whole bunch of VMs and stuff like that. You do get a better performance actually with Xeon Max. And that was kind of cool to see. And we do have a Nginx CDN workload like using the STH main site and like our actual access patterns from a couple years ago on there. And, and, and I'll just say this, I, I would not put in Xeon Max in there for this. You may get a performance gain, but I would not use a HBM2E part for like web hosting. That's like the wrong use case, but it was just kind of interesting just to go try out. Now, I know a lot of folks are gonna ask about this Xeon Max versus the AMD Epic Genoa X. And this is a 96 core part with 1.1 gigabytes of level three cache, but it doesn't have that like 64 gigs of HBM2E memory. So how, how do we even think about that? Now that's a wild search domain, right? With like 12 Intel configs and two, you know, the SMT on and off for Geno X. There's a lot of different configs that you'd have to test. And that's just frankly uh, more than we had time to do for this video. But generally what we saw is that if you have a smallish data set that can utilize that L3 cache effectively and also scales out to 96 cores, the Geno X is an awesome part. On the other hand, some folks want to use things like Intel AMX for AI and like the instructions that Intel has that AMD doesn't have. And also if you just have a larger work working data set that fits in that sweet spot where it's more than the Geno X can cache and caches with effectively in HBM2E because you have 64 gigs, then the Xeon Max performs well. But the cool thing to me is that you can have the HBM2E memory, you can have DDR5, have it in cache mode, just basically drop in the processor and you get a nice performance boost just from that. There's not like a whole lot you actually have to do. So this is definitely one of those ones where it's like, it depends, a huge amount is on the configuration and exactly what your workload is. Um, but you know, frankly, if you're gonna go buy these things, these things are so expensive, like go get on systems, try your workload on both of the solutions and decide what's best for you. And I would try, you know, the regular Xeon, the Xeon Max, like try all the different kinds of parts. And while we've talked 
talked about the system both with and without DDR5 memory. One of the things that you have to remember is that by removing the DDR5 memory, you are removing a lot of power because like you're not powering all these different memory modules. I just want to note here that some vendors use 10 watts per DDR5 dim and we, we just don't generally see that much like power going to the memory in our systems. But I, I will just note that some folks do use that number. And that gets us to our power consumption section. Okay, so I wanna talk really quickly about power consumption because there's a little quirk here that a lot of folks don't know about these chips, but I didn't even know until somebody told me. The main thing about these is that they are 350 watt TDP parts, and those are pretty high-end parts, but they're not necessarily the highest TDP parts that we've seen, especially when you start looking at things beyond CPUs and you start looking at things like GPUs or anything like that. Now, these things have giant honking heat sinks to be able to handle that heat, and a lot of these systems will be liquid-cooled because it's just more efficient to liquid-cool things if you can. So we ran the system at full tilt. We just kind of saw how much power we could get with the memory. We saw that we were getting close to one kilowatt, which is pretty darn high, actually. There might be other ways to get it to go a little bit higher. There might be ways to get it a little bit lower, but that's a good reference, especially when you have things like 350 watt TDP CPUs, two of them, you're already at 700 watts and those CPUs can climb up from there. However, when we re removed the memory and we were just using the HBM, well, that actually removes 16 DIMMs. At the wall, we were seeing over 40 watts lower power consumption on the server without the dims in there. And I've heard folks say that you can get anywhere from like 80 to 100 watts on a dual socket server like this, depending on what your cooling setup is and just how hard you're hitting that DDR5 memory. And there's one more challenge with liquid cooling a server like this that this actually solves. If you remove the memory, the cold plate cools the entire CPU and as well as the memory. On many high performance servers that have high end liquid cooling, you'll see that there are still fans because you also have to cool other components, but a big component is also the memory. And so you'll see that there are these like little memory cold plates that go into these servers. And this server, if you don't have any DDR5, you're already cooling your CPU and memory with a single cold plate, which makes the design a lot easier. But the last thing I just wanna point out is something that I heard as a rumor, we didn't get to test this, but one of the reasons that you don't have a workstation version of this, because I know folks are probably like sitting there like, oh my gosh, this would be like the coolest workstation. Well, the reason you can't do it is that this actually does not support the idle states that you would need to go and have like, like sleep states in a desktop environment. Now in the high performance computing realm, most folks are assuming that these things are running 24 seven anyway, but if you did wanna go do that, that would be something that have to be added. And I've heard that the reason for that was actually due to the HBM memory. Now with all these videos, I love to have key lessons learned because well, I feel like you should always learn something whenever you do one of these videos. And for this, I think, you know, a couple of things out. Number one, like a lot of folks don't even know that Xeon Max exists outside of the high performance computing crowd. And now I think a lot more folks do, but I think that brings up a really good point. I think Intel needs to have a strategy where they say like, hey, this is our socket and here are the different types of processors you can get in that socket. Right now, if you look at Intel's differentiation, it's mostly down to things like, you know, how many cores, what the clock speed is, what the TDP is, and then what type of or how many accelerators are enabled in a given SKU. And I think that that message really made a lot of sense when it was just a normal Xeon and, you know, you just had a couple different cores to play with, all that kind of stuff. But now when you have things that are completely different like a CPU that has HBM 2e memory that doesn't even need dims and has a different performance profile because of it. I really feel that Intel should put a little bit more effort behind these parts and if you're watching this video I hope you came away with one of two things one if you don't know what this is I hope you learned what Xeon Max is because I think it's super cool and it's fun from a technology perspective but the other one is for folks that deploy a lot of servers maybe you have a bunch of servers out there and you're not really sure should you be using Sapphire Rapid so fourth gen Intel Xeon scale or the Xeon Max for that, I would say go see if you can find an OEM or Intel or on their dev cloud or something like that and get access to it and go run a workload. Because if you do fit the types of profiles where you need that memory bandwidth and you can use that memory bandwidth, then this thing is a home run. And Intel is very focused on showing the HPC benefits because the big win for this was in the Aurora supercomputer. But what we find with all of these parts that either have more cache or they have all of the extra, you know, HBM2 memory, you find that there are certain applications that just do way better when you have that extra memory or at least memory close to that CPU. So my advice would be if you do think that this might be something for you, go check it out because it works in most regular servers as long as they can handle the high TDP parts. Hey guys, I hope you liked this video and you learned something. If you did, well, 
well, why don't you, well, share it with one of your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on the notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.